First of all, can you hear me? Yes. A little feedback there. It's ringing a little bit. That better? Okay. I think those were our saddles on the bar, right, Russ? Mm -hmm. <laughs> those, were the, those were the cowboys. I'm glad to be here. It's the first time here. I've never been up in this part of the country. It's very beautiful here, and, and uh, I'm glad to be here. I've been enjoying it so far. And uh, we'll give, our, you know, give you a good idea of what we do, why we do it, and uh, let you know that we have been successful with it. I was uh, exposed to uh, Dave's uh, language procedure about five years ago. But before I get into that, if you see me kind of bouncing around here, wandering around, I'm actually blind by definition. I used to be a farmer rancher in North Dakota, nearly lost my life in a farm accident back in 1986. And, and uh, speaking with uh, uh, about the health issues, I'm running on 28 screws, five pieces of steel, a transplanted liver, and I'm blind by definition. So if anyone knows about the, the the issues of health, I've been down that road. Uh, and so I'm just fortunate to be alive. There's a, the good things and the bad side The bad side of medicine. If it's done correctly, it can do wonderful things. And if there's mistakes made and, and wrong prescriptions done, they can cost you your life, which nearly happened to me. Fortunately for me, I have a, a wife who is an RN and a nurse educator, and I have some pre-professional medical training myself, so we were able to uh, prevent some of those things which, were ja which actually would have caused, cost me my life. So, so it's helpful to know what's going on right now. Uh, only I can be responsible for me. I can't be responsible for someone else. I can't educate them. I can give you information, just what we're searching out here. And, uh, but only I can take full accountability and responsibility for me, and I can do my best then to help others, and that's what we're here, and that's what we're about. Now, with the David Mil Wynn Miller procedures, one of the first things I'll say is, is this, and Russell and I are in agreement on this. We don't come to slay Caesar, so to speak. We come, in effect, to praise Caesar in that sense and, and say this. There's a wrong way and a right way to do things, and this is, the, I think, the same thing that Mr. Begich was talking about and Mr. Tunney and, and several others. But what is it? How do we seek out knowledge? Uh, how do we attain knowledge? What process do we use to process information, which comes to a process of thinking? And from what I've discovered, I've homeschooled children. I, I've, uh, we've had seven youngsters, and I won't get into that. And not all my own stepchildren, all those things. And you look at an educational system, and you ask yourself the question. And what I see is they teach us what to think, but they don't teach us how to think. And that's the critical thing that we need to really take a good look at. Now, every, all, every one of us thinks in a language we speak. Uh, Eric, uh, you're French. You can speak French and English very well. I got to meet Eric personally for the first time. And I've got a question for you, Eric. Maybe you can tell me this. I, my background is German. When you speak French, do you think in English? No. You think in French, right? When you speak English, you think what English? Okay, when I'm German, when I want to speak in German, I have, to sp I have to think in German to speak the German. If I want to speak in English, I have to speak in English. So what happens now, now that's the foundation I want to create here is this, is what happens or what language do you speak in? You speak or you think in the language you've been taught. So in effect, what happens when I if I corrupt the language? I corrupted the, your entire thought process. And so this is, this is kind of what I want to introduce this with, it, so, so that we can begin to correct. What, 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 what Mr. Miller's language procedure in effect does, it begins to correct the thinking process. Because if we can't process information correctly, how can we ever, ever arrive at truth? And especially when we communicate with one another. That's not just on a personal level, but on, with one another and then how we engage in contract business, not just as one-to-one, -one, but then as nations and as groups uh, globally. And so we can take it down to the lowest common denominator and just as far as we can expand that circle. 
And so that's kind of, in effect, what we've done, what we're, what we're about. So now where I started was, was about five years ago. I had an, uh, a fellow uh, give me some information about this, and it started over a little parking citation. $10 parking citation, and I'll lay this out for you. This is the simplest thing. I, have, I own a little business. I have, matter of fact, a music store, so I kind of have you know, some of the stuff that's going on here, and a bookstore. But I, I, I rent my business from a theater that's next door. It's a public building. So the city paints a yellow line in front of the theater, which encompasses my bus the front of my business. But the theater is closed during the day when I'm open. And my, my business is closed when the theater is open. But the, but the police enforce the yellow line 24 hours a day. So I can't even park in front of my business without getting a parking citation. I'm saying, geez, what's going on here? Somebody isn't thinking. If the theater is closed, why do they need to enforce the parking? Does that make sense? But so when I go down and I challenge the court on the parking citation, I'm saying, hey, doesn't the police officer have enough sense to know when to enforce a law and when not to enforce a law? Who am I damaging here? Nobody. Nobody. But they said, hey, you got to pay the fine. I says, duh, this don't make sense. And so it had nothing to do about the money. It had to do with principle. I mean, I'm, not, I'm, I'm an easygoing guy. I'm a friendly guy. I may be blind as a bat now, but back then I was still driving. <laughs> and so I, when, I, when I found this language, I says, well, good grief. How can they impose something, a performance on me when I've not damaged anybody? And it's obviously that I'm having, some, I'm having damage because of them enforcing a, a city ordinance that doesn't make sense. And so that's when I was exposed to David's law procedure and I, and I started studying it and I used it. And uh, man, they went ballistic. Over 10 bucks. <laughs> and, and so here's, what, here's what's happening. Okay, and I'm gonna lay out a little scenario. You've got a city, which is a corporation. I don't know how much is, is the city down here corporated more than likely it is. Okay, so, so you've got a corporate entity, and uh, you're subject to that corporation's rules. How do you get out of that? How do you deal with all those issues? And so the basic thing, number one, then, comes down to, to language. Now, how many of you have been exposed to some of this before? Quite a good number? Yeah, okay. good number. Okay, good. so all the doubters. What was that? I said good. All the all the naysayers. All the, all the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a good thing. Well, you, I don't know how many of you, how many of you you know even though you've been exposed to, to it, how many have probably used it? Because what I've been hearing, okay, what I've been hearing is you just haven't been able to get much results out of it. You've got their attention, but they've just really been stonewalling and whatnot. And the reason why they stonewall it so much and they, and they do not want to acknowledge it is because you're so close, you're right there at the door knocking on it. And the technology that you have can put them out of business. And you think that don't scare the living daylights out of them? I don't know what else will. So the first thing is, about the language procedure is knowing how to control the subject matter and, and the language for contract, okay? Now, I don't know how many of you have seen just the basics, but for those who haven't, I'm just gonna do a very little simple analogy so you can see what happens. Now, I'm gonna step up on here, so if I don't stumble, you know, give me a shot here, okay. And I'm gonna make something very simple. How many of you have a digital clock in your home? Okay. What do you see on that digital clock? Okay, you see the colons, right? Well, we don't have seconds on most of them because we don't break it down that close. How many of you can see that? Okay. So if you've got hours, minutes, and seconds, and you've got the colons in there. Now, most of us are familiar. We call it o'clock. It's a contraction for of the clock, right? Everybody agrees on that? Okay. So the colons, we say here we got three hours of the 30 minutes of the 30 seconds. We can read it backwards. It's the same thing. You take the punctuation out, you can't control it, right? And we all know that numbers are nouns. Okay, so I'm gonna do something here. I'm gonna say, okay, this is the, this is a noun. 
minutes are a noun, seconds are a noun. We got three elements there, okay? Let's just hold on to that for now, okay? Now what happens when I do this? If I write 35, it equals 35, right? When I translate it into numbers, right? Okay, now watch what happens. Now if I take the punctuation out, it becomes this, right? Would you agree? Okay, what is that telling us? It's telling us that there's a procedure that controls subject matter. Okay, these are nouns, and they're punctuated in order to be nouns, right? Okay, now let's see how many of you pick up on this. Those of you that haven't been exposed to this in the past, okay, just, just to give you a short reason why this is important. It's, we got it, okay, it's okay. Now, I've got, this is my name, Gordon James Gunch. What's the problem here between this and this up here? Yeah. If I have to use punctuation to control numbers, which is time. Whoop, we're moving here. Oh, I got you. Yeah, it's the clip. Uh, why do I, what's wrong with my name? And, and, and this is what happens. Why aren't they taught that in our schools? We can teach mathematics correctly. We know that 2 plus 2 equals 4. So why don't they teach us to put punctuation in our name? That's the simplest thing there. And there you can see that we need procedure to control subject matter. So, what, so here's what happens. I've, we've, we've, been, we've had some, some pretty good successes. And this is why language is important, because words mean things. And I'm going to give you a couple examples of some of the things I've experienced, OK? Because I'm not going to get so much into the procedural aspect of this thing, but just to show you to, because what I want you to do is to, to, is to begin to get you to think. My son had an accident. He was driving my car, and he was, I think he was about 17 at that point in time. And he was going to the park, and he come around the corner, and uh, he was going a little too fast. So instead of stepping on the brake, he stepped on the gas, thinking he was going to step on the brake, and he hit a tree, a tree and just mashed my Ford. So the police took a, an accident report. And they got him, you know, they, they basically uh, sent him a court date and asked him to show up in court. And they wrote him a careless driving citation. Now, I didn't get into the issues of the, in the noun technology, but I wanna, what I want to show you is what this does. It will give you an ability to identify what's going on, okay? What's wrong with an accident report? On the accident report, they wrote him a careless driving citation. Did anybody bother to look up in the dictionary what the definition of accident is? An accident says it's an accident. Nobody's liable for damages because that's why it's an accident, right? How can you assign liability on an accident report? The guy that drew up this form, where was he? What school did he go to? Why didn't they write it up? A wreck report. Now, if we got a wreck report, maybe we can assign liability to somebody. So I come into court and I'm saying, how can you write my son a careless driving citation on an accident report? and then assign liability. Now, I didn't even go into Miller's law procedures. And I'll uh, put, the, put the police officer, wrote the citation, you know, put him under oath, put him on the witness stand. I says, could you explain to me how you could uh, make a, uh, a finding on an accident report that my son was driving carelessly? And he looked at me and smiled, because he knew he had just been had. <laughs> on his own report. See, and so this is the significance of what I'm trying to tell you. Take the time to sit down and analyze and think about what you're writing or about what you're reading or what you're saying, because words mean things. Uh, I, can, and, and, uh, I mean, even the I mean, even the, in, even the prosecutor, I had a laugh at that one. Uh, they just vacated that one. 
I told them, well, you know, they're going to dismiss it. And I said, you can't dismiss that. I said, you got to vacate it. It never happened. How can this, the city is liable for nothing? It didn't damage anybody. All they did was knock a little bark off a tree. You couldn't even tell that the tree had been smacked, but basically told my car. Fortunately for him, there was no injuries. But, but this, is, this is what I'm trying to tell you. Now, Russell and I have had quite a bit of success with this. Uh, and we're to the point now where they don't really bother us. Now, we always want to be very, very responsible for everything that we do. We don't go out and break laws just to break laws simply because to prove the fact that we can do that. We don't do that. What we, what we are actually about is, is just trying to teach people a mechanism that they can begin to control their environment around them by how they process information. And we love Canada. We love Canada customs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, uh, well, well, go ahead. Go ahead, tell that one. When Let we, him get up When here. we come through customs, of course, I had Eric send me a $1 stamp of Canada. Yeah. Canceled here at your local post office. Well, with no ID or no nothing, I simply cancel the stamp and write my contract on it. Stroll on into customs mm -hmm. and simply look at the lady and say, well, cool, from one postmaster to another. I'm postmaster of a bankrupt corporation, Canada. <laughs> she read my document, asked for no identification, put Canadian customs authorization over the top of my bullet stamp. They're invoking contract universally through joinder and unity on making all on all contracts, if you'll see, and putting her initials clearly on Canadian customs stamp. Did you putting that? putting Canadian customs authorization on my bill of lading. No authorization, no Driver's license. He no didn't nothing. even show picture ID. ID. No picture ID. Nothing. Stamps work. Language works. Of course, they turn all red. I disqualified their customs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I'll, I'll hand this to the, let you guys look at it. See what? <laughs> I'm gonna walk. Oh, is he okay to go? Oh, okay. Yeah, basically, when we showed up at customs, the, you know, when you're flying in, they're going to hand you these little uh, cards where you got to declare or whatever. Well, declare meaning nothing anyway. You're not going to. So what you Nothing's going to be said clearly, but that's what declare means. There's no declaration, so there's no clarity, so what you're going to claim? <laughs> yeah, so basically what you do is you disqualify them for fictitious conveyance of language. You don't get flushed about it. You don't get scared. You stroll up to them and tell them who you are. Mm -hmm. It's nothing personal with anybody on the planet. In fact, I'm friendly with all postmasters on the planet. No ill will for any postmasters or any government agencies that may be in here today. So... Point being, you can control the world around you by how you contract on a global basis, through bills of ladings, through stamps, through knowing who you are and being very confident about it. Take a very humble approach. Give them authorization. No judge on this planet has any authority. If the judge tells you, I'm not authorized, give it to him. Swear him in right on the spot. He will <laughs> honor that. He will honor that. Here's give him, the, give yeah. him a contract to authorize. Tell him you can read it frontwards and backwards. How would you like to see no deviation of five different, six different languages and go to your computer and download it? It's real simple, sh control shift. So you can switch it to French or to Spanish or to wherever you need to go. Be confident. Stay on point. A lot of things, a big famous thing that they like to do to us is put us in mental institutions. Stay on point. When the judge is screaming in your face, I'm going to put you in a mental institution, you look at him and say, hey, when you use in as a prefix, it becomes a particle of negation. So I guess you're going to send me to a no institution, a non institution. What are you talking about? <laughs> Stay on point. Yeah. That is your problem here in Canada. Know who you are. Be confident. Don't yeah. get scared. Knowledge, knowledge, knowledge removes fear. The only thing they have is fear. See, because their only authorization, their only uh, authority is in the fictitious conveyance of language. If you know where you're at, we, we, this actually happened when Russell went into the federal court. This was a United States Marshal. Uh, and we kid him. We say, United Modification of a Pronoun States, Marshal, where do you have any authority now? And they say, See, we, we have none. Don't have any. And so when we processed an order through the clerk and asked the marshal for, or basically ordered the marshal for a performance, which was to open the court at such and such a time and date and place, and he says, well, we don't take our orders from the clerk. 
and we only do signatures. He looked at him and he says, hey, you know you're right. Great. We do. We're in the truth and we do autographs. And so we're ordering a performance. And his, he, his jaw about dropped and his eyes got wide. And you know what? He didn't disagree. In fact, when we came to court against the Internal Revenue Service, who I've, I went to court and sued them for fictitious conveyance of language. Yeah. They agreed with me 100%. I said, yes, there is no law on the truth. There is no obligation to pay. Where do you want us to place our authorization? Here, here, and here. And they agreed to it. So I'm 27 years old, and I no, no longer have a tax obligation anywhere on this planet. It's a pretty, <laughs> pretty good feeling. Little trick is it says individual income tax. Well, since in is a preposition, but when used as a prefix as a particle of negation, I guess nobody's there and there's nothing to tax. And income, there's no come, and, when and there's no individual, so there's nobody there and nothing to tax. So how am I supposed to pay this tax? With what? Because I don't exist. <laughs> but take a